100 D1 coaches were asked who the best team in college basketball will be this season, and not nearly enough of them, said Gonzaga. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, make every moment more. It is the dog days of summer. The sports are not sportsing like we want them to, but this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. There's something for everyone every day all summer long, so visit FanDuel.com to get started. Well, folks, BYU released the saddest non-conference schedule that I have ever seen. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a little disrespect from the national media about Gonzaga's guard play, the backcourt in general. We're going to get to that. But first, we are going to talk about the Candid Coaches series. For those of you who are not plugged into following every piece of college basketball content throughout the offseason the way that I am, you may not know as much about this series. It is a, a yearly event series of articles written at CBS Sports by Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish, the two hosts of the Ion College Basketball Podcast, also both uh, writers for CBS Sports. What they do, they spend about a month collecting interviews with 100 plus different Division I basketball coaches. And they're not all just Power Five head coaches. They are a, a mixture of those premier, well-known you know, most best of the best college basketball coaches in the country, all the way down to assistant coaches at the mid-major level or low-major level. They get a nice variety of different coaches. They get a hundred or so different names, like we said, and they pitch them a variety of questions. In this case, 10 different questions. And, And Gary and Matt are going to turn those 10 different questions into a series of 10 different articles that they're going to publish on CBS over the next couple of weeks. They then kind of break down the the analysis, pull some of the quotes. It's all anonymous, so none of the coaches are named at all, which is part of the reason that they get more candid answers, hence the name Candid Coaches Series uh, that comes out from that. It's it's great content. Gonzaga is very often mentioned in the the variety of different questions uh, and conversations that are had. So this is probably not going to be the first time uh, or the last time, I should say, that we mentioned the Candid Coaches Series here on Locked on Zags over the next couple of months as we are in the post-Olympics pre-basketball portion of the uh, offseason here on Locked on Zags. So the first question, the first article that was written was published at CBS on Monday. It is discussing the the first question that they asked all the coaches, which was simple. Who will be the best team in college basketball this season? That's it. That was the question that was proposed. Eight different teams received votes from the 100 plus different coaches that were asked. Gonzaga was among those eight teams. They fell into Gary's uh, others receiving votes category as they only laid the laid out the actual percentages for the top five teams that received votes. Those top five teams were in order. Kansas, 35.6% of the votes. Alabama, 27.9%. Houston, 13.5%. Duke, 9.6%. Yukon, the two-time defending national champions, at fifth at 7.7%. Others receiving votes were Arizona, Baylor, Gonzaga, and North Carolina. I said eight. My math was wrong. That is nine teams that received votes uh, for the best team in college basketball. If we assume that they were written in order, that means Gonzaga received the eighth most votes for first place, or another way to put it is they received the second fewest votes among the nine teams that did receive votes. Now, the question, who is the best team in college basketball, does it – Saying Gonzaga is eighth on this list because of where they received votes is not entirely accurate. A lot of the preseason way too early polls that we've seen do have Gonzaga in that five to 10 range. And frankly, when the AP poll comes out uh, months from now, as we get closer to the season, eighth actually feels kind of about where Gonzaga is going to be. So I think this list is fairly accurate to that point. But again, how many of these coaches would have actually had Gonzaga second or third or fifth, uh, but they just didn't pick them first? I I mean, that's kind of what makes you 
the, the results here, the data that you're looking at is only who each coach specifically mentioned at number one, not an actual ranking of those teams in, in the top five or top 10 or anything like that. So is this list accurate? I think is the question here. How many votes should Gonzaga get? I'm not surprised that Gonzaga didn't get a ton of votes as the top team in college basketball. I'm also not surprised that they did get some. If this list had come out and there had been another team on that list or just those eight teams and Gonzaga didn't get any votes, I would be a little surprised. We'd have a different conversation, a little bit of a different tone uh, in this conversation here. But honestly, pretty much everywhere you look, if you have been looking at those top 25 rankings at this point in the offseason or even uh, previous points in the offseason, Kansas, Alabama, and Houston are almost universally one, two, and three. And that here they are, the three teams that received 10% or more of the votes here were those three teams, Kansas, Alabama, and Houston. And I think it's that's probably accurate. Kansas had a tremendous offseason. They bring in a, a high-level score in A.J. Store in the transfer portal. They get Zeke Mayo from South Dakota State, Ryland Griffin from Alabama, Shaquille Moore from Mississippi State. They just added David Coit from Northern Illinois. He averaged 21 points a game last year. Those guys all join a core that includes Hunter Dickinson. K.J. Adams is back. Dewan Harris is back. They lose El Marco Jackson for the season to an injury, but they have – uh, some other young Jamari McDowell is going to step up. They have a pair of freshmen coming in. This is a good deep team. On paper, this team is a, a, a probably a better roster than Gonzaga's. I think it's very close. And I think people will understandably acknowledge that Gonzaga boat raced this Kansas team last year. Granted, it was a different looking Kansas team. They were injured. Uh, they were missing some guys. And I think this version of Kansas is going to be a lot better. And I think they deserve to be in this conversation. But I think Gonzaga's right there with them. Alabama, I get it. Mark Sears is back. Latrell Wright sells back. Grant Nelson is back. They add Cliff Omarui from Rutgers. They add uh, Aiden Holloway, transfer from Auburn. They add Houston Millette. Shout out Pepperdine. Uh, Millette heads over there. He's going to be a big piece for them as well. Houston loses Jamal Shedd, but they keep LJ Cryer, Emmanuel Sharp. Terrence Arsenault missed most of last year with an injury. I think he's a very strong breakout candidate in the Big 12. So those three teams, I think, are, are the, the right, correct top three teams at this point. But I'm very happily willing to argue Gonzaga as four or five, whereas in this thing, they, they came in a little bit lower than that. But again, a lot of those those coaches may have had Gonzaga in that you know three to five range if they were asked to expand their list a little bit farther. I'm hesitant about UConn. I've said I'm on the show before, I'm happy to eat my words. If UConn does make another run, goes for a three-peat, or at least gets back in the you know top five conversation, final four conversation, runs the table in the Big East, whatever it may be, uh, I've been vocally a little hesitant about whether Aiden Mahaney can fit into a very different system, uh, become more of a volume shooter at, at UConn than he is at, than he was at St. Mary's. We'll see if he can do it. Great. If he can't, I think that's a, a, a knock for them. They're counting on him in a pretty big way. And if he can't step up, that could be a challenge for Danny Hurley's team. Arizona, I think is good, but I, I would pick Gonzaga's roster over Arizona's in part because of the continuity. Same thing with UConn. UConn returns one starter. They got some key players who were bench pieces last year who are going to step into bigger roles like Hassan Diar, like Solomon Ball, Samson Johnson. Arizona gets a couple of really big-time transfers in. Toby Awaka comes over from Tennessee. Uh, they get a, a couple of mid-major transfers, Anthony Del Orso, Trey Townsend from Oakland. Those guys are going to step into some bigger roles. They get Caleb Love back, Jaden Bradley's back. I think Arizona's going to be good, but I'd take Gonzaga over them. I'd take Gonzaga over them. I'd take Gonzaga over UConn. Baylor and North Carolina, that, that's closer. That's closer. Baylor doesn't have as much continuity, but my goodness, Jaden Nunn is coming back, joining a backcourt with Jeremy Roach, who transfers over from Duke. Norchad O'Meara has, for the record, folks, Norchad O'Meara has averaged a double-double all four years he's been in college basketball. Two of them were at the mid-major level, but the last two were at Miami. He has averaged a double-double for four straight seasons. That is a tremendous player to add to your front court for Baylor. So I think Baylor's right around there with Gonzaga. I think North Carolina is going to be right there. I'm worried about North Carolina's front court. They lose Armando Baycott. They didn't make any big splashy moves in the portal uh, in the front court, but they get RJ Davis back, Elliot Cadeau's back. They got a couple of really high level freshmen joining that team. So I think they're going to be in that conversation as well. Gonzaga being five through 10 when the AP poll comes out is probably, I think, I think that's what we should expect as a fan base. And I think that's about right. I think you can argue them as high as four. I think you can somewhat reasonably argue them even higher than that. Although I think four feels about right. Uh, and I think part of this is people are looking at Gonzaga's roster and they're so depth that the depth is incredible. The talent is incredible. And I think it's important to remember, like that's true of a lot of teams. 
College basketball is going to be really good next year. A lot of high-profile players returned, like R.J. Davis and Caleb Love and Mark Sears. Uh, a lot of high prof- the, the freshman classes that were kind of weak the last couple of years are, are kind of getting out of that, that phase. And this, this year's class with Cooper Flagg and the two players at Rutgers and, and a handful of other guys is going to be really good. So you have an influx of talent in freshmen. You have a lot of guys staying in college because of NIL and various other factors. So it's going to be a really good year in college basketball. And Gonzaga's roster is great, and the depth is incredible, and the talent level is through the roof. But there are a lot of really good teams in college hoops. Gonzaga being one of the top five, I feel like they're in that conversation. They're absolutely in the top ten, but this kind of gives us a good sense of, like, yeah, they're – there's, there's a lot of other teams that are kind of in a similar position of getting back a lot of talent, adding a lot of talent, and putting themselves in a position to be really good this upcoming season. Well, we're talking, we're talking about depth and talent in Gonzaga's backcourt. <laughs> they have all that in spades, yet they seem to be a bit underappreciated nationally, and we're going to talk more about that in just a second. But first, folks, let's talk about today's sponsor, FanDuel, because I love sports and you love sports. We all love sports. That's why we're listening to sports podcasts here in mid-August. We don't ever want them to stop. But it's the dog days of summer. The Olympics are wrapped up and we got fewer games. The sports just aren't sportsing like we want them to. However, FanDuel lets the sports go keep going whenever we want. All we have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime we are in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all their customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. And we've been talking about where Gonzaga kind of ranks and slots in among those top teams in college basketball. FanDuel likes them very similarly to where we saw in that coaches, candid coaches conversation. They were eighth. They have the eighth highest odds to win the national championship. They are tied with Baylor and North Carolina, the two other teams that received votes here, plus 2,000 odds right now at FanDuel to win it all. If you think this is Mark Few's year, got his gold medal, he's going to go out and get himself a national championship, then what are you waiting for? Head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, folks, segment two, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag's podcast, and we're still talking about how the media is talking about Gonzaga right now in the midst of the offseason. And, folks, if you want to hear more about these other college basketball programs. If you want to learn more about North Carolina's offseason or what's going on at Baylor with Roach and O'Meara and those guys, check out Locked On Tar Heels. Isaac Shade, my co-host on Locked On College Basketball, does a great job with that show. Cam Stewart, Locked On Baylor, fantastic show there as well. Both friends of the podcast. Definitely shows worth checking out if you have not done so yet. Wherever you find Locked On Zags, you can find Locked On Tar Heels or Locked On Baylor there as well. So, Second segment here, want to kind of continue the similar conversation, but talk more specifically about a different uh, media outlet, Sleepers Media. For those of you who are on social media, on Twitter, they're very active there. And look, these guys do a great job. I'm not trying to, to, to drag them at all. I'm, they released a list of their top 25 backcourts in college basketball, or I should say they've been releasing them throughout the last couple of weeks. Uh, they have video kind of descriptions on, on each team and, and analysis, and it's great. It's great content, and I, and I like a lot of the list, but they have Gonzaga too low. And that's what we're going to talk about here is, is Gonzaga's backcourt being a, a little bit disrespected here. Uh, we've seen it in other places as well where there's just kind of, I think, a hesit- I think a lot of it is going to, frankly, is people's hesitance about Nolan Hickman uh, in particular. But I just, I was surprised to see how far down on this list a Gonzaga backcourt that was incredibly productive last year that returns many of the pieces that were productive parts last year that adds a newcomer in Caleb Battle, who's expected to take on a huge role in Gonzaga's backcourt that effectively adds a newcomer in Steel Venters. And and perhaps they're counting him as a wing and not as part of the guard rotation. And if that's the case, I suppose that's fine to, to maybe, you know, not count him there. I think you've got to count one of him or Dusty Stromer because out of, out of those two guys, some of them, they're going to play some minutes at the shooting guard position. There's no doubt about it. Gonzaga's going to play their three guard lineups with, with Nemhard and Hickman and Battle on the floor at the same time. Uh, Venters is going to be in that mix. Strummer is going to be in that mix. I don't expect Emmanuel Innocente to play a, a particularly big role next year. Braden Smith, of course, it, it's fair for them to not count him among their backcourt members for this upcoming season as he is playing to redshirt. But the talent on this roster is better than where they had them ranked, and they had them 16th the 16th best backcourt in college basketball, according to Sleepers Media on their the the series that they've been doing, releasing uh, each of the top 25 backcourts in college basketball. Here are the 15 teams that are ahead 
of Gonzaga on this list. Number one is Baylor. That I'm fine with that. Jeremy Roach uh, is a huge addition for them. They get Jaden Nunn back. VJ Edge comes one of the best freshmen in the country. That's a fun backcourt. North Carolina, we mentioned them already. Cadeau and RJ Davis alone is fantastic. They add Kate Tyson, transfer, uh, who's a high-level shooter from Belmont. That's a that's a great one. Alabama, same thing. Latrell Wrightsell, Mark Sears, Aiden Holloway, Houston Millett, sign me up. Done and dusted there. That's great. Arkansas comes in at number four. I'm not super excited. I'm a little hesitant more on Arkansas, but John L. Davis by himself should put this team in the top five. He is that good. If DJ Wagner takes a leap as a sophomore, yep, that team's in that conversation. Florida, Todd Golden is a guard whisperer. Lots of success there. Walter Clayton's back. Will Richard is back. They had Elijah Martin from FAU. Uh, Arizona comes in next, the Jaden Bradley, Caleb Love experience. We're going to see how that looks for another season uh, for the Wildcats and Tommy Lloyd. Texas, number seven, Tremont Mark transfers over from Arkansas. They get Jordan Pope from Oregon State, who averaged about 18 a game last year. Iowa State returns all the key pieces from their backcourt last year, including Taman Lipsy. Purdue returns both Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer. They come in at number nine. Ten is Rutgers, and I just... I can't put a backcourt that is going to start two freshmen and Rutgers. They, they were only counting. Uh, I believe they're only counting Ace Bailey as a guard. And they were kind of counting Dylan Harper as more of a wing. And look, they're two of the three best freshmen in the country. I get it, but I cannot put Rutgers ahead of Gonzaga. I just would not have that Rutgers squad. Whose third guard is Jeremiah Williams, who is fine. He's fine, but he's no, he wouldn't be in the rotation at Gonzaga. So I'm just, I'm not sure about that. 11 is St. John's and I'm stunned that St. John's is behind Rutgers and behind some of these other teams. I, probably, I think I'd have St. John's in the top five. Kadari Richmond was one of the best transfers in all of college basketball comes over from Seton hall, a, a triple double machine. He's a guy who could get a triple double any given night. They had Devin Smith from Utah who averaged like, 12, 7, and 8 or something like that last year. He's also a triple-double machine. Uh, St. John's going to have a really good backcourt. Number 12, that's where you see UConn, Aiden Mahaney, Hassan Diara stepping into a bigger role. I think they're counting incoming freshman Liam McNeely as a guard as well, though he's kind of more of a wing. 13, you get Miami. Nigel Pack is back for what feels like his seventh year of college basketball. They get a star freshman in Jaleel Bathia coming in as well. 14, you see Houston, LJ Cryer's back. Emmanuel Sharp, Terrence Arsenault, that's a good backcourt there as well. 15 is Tennessee. They lose Santiago Vescovi. Of course, they lose Dalton Connect. I'm not super thrilled about Tennessee's backcourt. They do add a high-level transfer in Chaz Lanier from North Florida, but um, um, I, I wouldn't have them above Gonzaga, and Gonzaga comes in at number 16 after that. Uh, the rest of the list will just rapid fire it. Marquette is 17. Duke is 18. Indiana's 19. Illinois is 20. Kansas, shockingly, is 21. I'd have them ahead of Gonzaga and ahead of almost every team on this list. I was very surprised how low they had the Jayhawks. Uh, 22, I actually don't have in my notes, so I apologize. 23 is Creighton. 24 is Texas A&M. 25 is a tie between UCLA and Kentucky. So that's what we got. There's your top 25 backcourts right there. It still ends up being 25, even if I have one missing because of the tie with UCLA and Kentucky. I don't see how you can have Gonzaga outside the top 10, and I'm not sure I'd have him outside the top eight convincing teams that I would I would immediately put ahead of Gonzaga's backcourt. Baylor, Carolina, Bama, Purdue, Iowa State, Kansas. Those are the teams that I think, okay, yes, I believe I would have those teams based on who they are returning ahead of Gonzaga. That would put them seventh. St. John's, there's a strong argument. Arkansas, there's an argument. Arizona and Florida, arguments, arguments. I think reasonably I'd probably have Gonzaga eighth which is funny, that seems to be the number that keeps standing out when we talk about Gonzaga, as I feel like that's about where they're going to be in the AP poll as well. But the uh, I think the depth issue that Gonzaga had last year feels completely resolved with the addition of Caliph Battle and the return of a healthy Steel Venters. I mean, that is a huge, huge area of growth for Gonzaga that I'm not sure is getting enough attention nationally. Caliph Battle is a, I mean, Michael Jai is getting a lot of attention as he totally should. Uh, the fact that Gonzaga's roster has got so much continuity is getting a lot of attention as it should. But Caliph Battle is such a massive addition for this team, not just because of the skill set that he provides, the experience that he provides, but he fills a role that was so desperately needed on last year's roster. They did not have that microwave score coming off the bench the way that Malachi Smith had filled that role in previous uh, the previous year. They didn't have a third guard at all, really, Luka Krajnovic, especially when he was hurt in the middle of the season. They just didn't even have somebody available to fill that spot. We know Mark Few loves those three-guard lineups. 
where they play all three guards at once, and then they can kind of, you know, uh, sub in a, a bigger player and kind of go go with more of a jumbo lineup and, and still keep two of the guards on the floor at the same time. Mark Few loves to do that. He's got the personnel to do it this year in a significant way. He could do four guard lineups pretty easily with this roster and, and still have enough size to compete, particularly in conference play. I think this is a top 10, top, arguably top five, at least top seven backcourt in all of college basketball and seeing them come in at 16 was just a little shocking to me. I, I think it's pretty clear that they're going to be better than that uh, by the time the season is over. Well, folks, we're closing up the show talking about BYU. They released their non-conference schedule on Monday. And folks, if this is the kind of competition that BYU wants to play in the non-conference, it's going to be a long time until they play Gonzaga again. We got more on that in just a second. But first, folks, let's talk about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. That's the formula for winning championships, and it's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. Because, folks, with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that W. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, folks, closing out the show today. Talking a little scheduling. We're going to talk a little bit about BYU's non-conference schedule because it was released on Monday, and it is shocking what teams they do and do not have on that schedule. We're also going to talk a little uh, WCC non-conference stuff as well. We're going to get more into some, some WCC stuff on Wednesday. It's WCC Wednesday, so stick with us as we kind of talk more about the conference, the offseason, all that fun stuff on Wednesday's show. But for today, we're going to focus more on a former WCC opponent. And it's relevant not just because they are a, a longtime rival of Gonzaga's and they're a, a team that we kind of expected maybe those two teams will start playing each other again, but BYU is also in the Big 12, a uh, potential future destination for Gonzaga, at least a place that Gonzaga would like to be. And we've seen a trend develop in the Big 12. And Brad Brownell called it out. Brad Brownell, the current head coach of the Clemson Tigers, who said, hey, the ACC is as good as the Big 12. But the reason the Big 12 schools all, uh, the Big 12 is considered a better conference, the reason they're talked about as a better conference is because the way that they schedule in the non-conference is all of their teams basically collectively decide to schedule bad teams. They, they have really low-ranking non-conference schedules. They beat up on these teams, get 30, 35, 40-point victories. It raises their net ranking because the net values your margin of victory, even against inferior opponents. And then what happens is conference play begins, and all of these teams have boosted where they are in the net rankings because of the, the lack of strength of schedule. And then a game between TCU and VC and TCU and BYU or Texas Tech and West Virginia or Central Florida and Kansas State or whomever is elevated. That game is going to be viewed as like, well, it was a tough loss for Kansas State against Central Florida, but hey, Central Florida's 45th in the net rankings, so it's only a quad two loss, you know, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in the ACC, anytime Clemson or anytime Miami or anytime Duke or North Carolina lost to, a, you know, an equal or a decent-ish ACC team like a Pitt or a Wake Forest or somebody like that, it was viewed a lot more negatively. And the net also punished them more because they're saying, well, Pitt's 69th in the net ranking, whereas, you know, again, Kansas State's 45th or, or whatever the example might be. And – there's some validity to that. There's also, you're, there's it's nothing against the rules of gaming the net system. If the net is not working and not functioning the way that it should, they'll make alterations to it. We've already seen the, the selection committee add different metrics to the uh, selection sheets that they're going to give out this year. So hopefully that'll allow the committee to make more informed decisions. But we've seen the Big 12 effectively decide whether they're actually, I mean, colluding is not really the right word because, again, it's not they're not breaking any rules, but whether the, the schools have collectively decided to schedule like this or not is a little, it's it's hard to prove they're doing it intentionally. They're also maybe saying, hey, we 
our conference schedule is just really tough, so we want to make sure we kind of pad the schedule with some easier games. Gonzaga kind of does the opposite, where they play a lot of really good teams in the non-conference. They mix in some bye games as well, of course, uh, but they play a lot of good teams because they don't get as many good opportunities in conference play. So we see BYU do the opposite, but this schedule, I mean, goodness, it stood out to me for how not competitive it's going to be. Here, here's the schedule. I'm going to read it to you. If I say at, that means it's a road game. You'll notice I'm not saying that much in this conversation. They start with Colorado Christian, a non-D1 school. Then they get Central Arkansas, UC Riverside out of the Big West, Queens, Idaho in the Big Sky, Mississippi Valley State, who was the worst D1 team in college basketball last year. Then they play in the Rady Children's Invitational. The four teams in that small MTE are Purdue, BYU, NC State, and Ole Miss. So that's going to be a decently competitive MTE there. Then they play at Providence. That is their lone road game on the schedule. It is also part of the Big 12 Big East Challenge, so not really a game that they actually picked to play on the schedule. Then they play Fresno State at home. Then they play Wyoming on a neutral site, and then they play Florida A&M. That's it. That's your non-conference schedule. The amount of power four teams, if you're just counting ACC, SEC, Big 10, Big 12, uh, that is on this schedule outside of the MTE is zero. If you count Providence and the Big East as a power conference, which I absolutely 100% do, then they have one. They have one power five opponent on the schedule, not in an MTE. They have one road game in the schedule, and that's it. And it's the same game at Providence. That is that is the only one. Again, they will play either two, two of the three between Purdue, NC State, and Ole Miss. That's a good trio of games. Purdue and, and NC State were both in the Final Four last year. Purdue's obviously weaker without Zach Eady. NC State was, I don't want to say a fluke, but it was a surprise run to the Final Four, let's put it that way. Uh, but that's it. This is a bad schedule. This is a bad, not competitive, non-conference schedule for, Gonzaga, or for BYU. Excuse me. I mean, there's no other way to, we're not going to sugarcoat it. Of course, there, even if it was Gonzaga, we're not going to sugarcoat it. This is bad. And, and the, the criticism that the Big 12 has gotten, I mean, last year, I think it was Iowa State's non-conference schedule was ranked 343rd, something like that. I'm paraphrasing the exact ranking, but it was outside the top 330. It was 361 Division One teams. Iowa State had one of the 20 worst competitive non-conference schedules in all of college basketball. TCU was somewhere in the same range. Those are two teams that made the NCAA tournament last year. Iowa State was legitimately good. And I'm not discrediting them by saying, well, their non-conference was bad, so their ratings were elevated. Like Some people are saying that about the entire conference collectively, and I think you could make an argument more so for like a TCU and teams that were like, okay, like they got a nine seed, they got a 10 seed, whatever it was, whereas Pitt and Wake Forest and St. John's and other teams that scheduled more competitive non-conference schedules got left out. Uh, and I think you could make an argument that like, hey, yeah, these teams deserved it over those teams that, that maybe were a bit more questionable. But ultimately, ultimately, we can talk about gaming the net system. We can talk about the collusion of the conference, whatever. The main point that I would make here is that this is just not good for college basketball. And that's not to disrespect Queens or, you know, Central Arkansas, Riverside, Idaho, whatever. Uh, it's not to say that those, the especially the SWAC schools like Mississippi Valley State or Gonzaga loves to play that program or those, you know, Alcorn State, Jackson State, Texas Southern, those schools need money. Being able to pay those schools to come to your campus and lose a basketball game is is uh, in some ways charitable and is not a bad thing. I think those games need to be a part of the schedule. But there's almost no competition for BYU in the schedule. And it's just not good for the game. Play more road games. Play more competitive opponents. Play Utah Valley. Play Utah. I guess, okay, we, we'll, we'll say not to Utah because they're in the same conference. I forgot about that. So they're good on Utah. But play Utah Valley, play Utah State. Why not play some of those types of games? Like you have the opportunity to, to play decent mid-major opponents. Like Fresno State was one of the worst Mountain West teams. That's the best. You, Wyoming was one of the worst Mountain West teams. You got two Mountain West teams on your schedule when you basically play in Mountain West country and you're playing one of them on a neutral, one of them at home. And there are two of the teams that finished at the bottom of that conference last year. You could play San Diego State, who I know they played last year. I know they played them last year. But you could play them. You could play Boise State. You could play these teams, and they choose not to do it. And again, I'm picking on BYU because they're a former Gonzaga rival, and there's their schedule is the one that happened to come out today as I'm recording this, but they're not alone. The, most of their conference mates do the same thing, and many other very pro, high-profile programs in other power conferences do the same thing. They're not alone. But it's not good for college basketball. 
and it's frustrating. And, and as and as somebody who wants to see Gonzaga and BYU play each other, would they ever schedule that? Not the way they're playing right now. Not the, not the way that they scheduled this year, at least. So I'm curious if this is going to change. I, I don't think college sports can mandate it, but it, or like the NCAA, they're not going to try to mandate anything like this because uh, anything they do to piss off the Power Four conferences is not good for the NCAA going forward. But I am curious if like more conferences will will schedule like these, you know, like the Big 12 Big East Challenge is what got BYU their only remotely competitive non-MTE game at Providence, like more things like that. And for power, like I'd love to see the WCC in the Mountain West have a scheduling agreement or the WCC try to get one with a power conference if you can, uh, eight or A10 or something like that. Like try to get some more competitive games because good teams in the, in the WCC, good teams in the Mountain West, they're, or in the A10, they're struggling because BYU, they, I mean, they're an example. They don't want to play any of those teams. <laughs> like they don't want to deal with that. That said, there are some good WCC games on the schedule this year. San Francisco is going to host Memphis. At the Chase Center, that's fantastic. November 21st, that's a really fun game. Again, it's a mid-major opponent for San Francisco, but it's arguably one of the five best mid-major opponents that you could play. Santa Clara loaded up a really fun non-conference schedule, uh, including St. Louis in Sioux Falls to start the season, Arizona State in Vegas. They're at Nevada. They're at McNeese. They're playing Stanford. They got TCU, and then the winner of Washington – or the uh, one of Washington or Colorado State – uh, those games will be in Palm Springs. So we are seeing some teams schedule up as best they can. Santa Clara, I think, would play better teams if they could, but that's still a really nice schedule that they have. Uh, we also saw Oregon State agree to a home-and-home -home series with North Texas, which I thought was interesting uh, and good for them, good for being willing to play. They're, they're going on the road to play North Texas this year. Not a lot of teams are willing to do that. I know Oregon State's not a power team anymore, technically, in the WCC, but that's still a fun game to see. So happy to see some of the games the WCC is willing to play. Uh, saddened and a little frustrated that BYU kind of fell into the same scheduling style that a lot of the other teams in the Big 12 have done, and that it's probably going to reward them with a higher net ranking than they may deserve uh, in Kevin Young's first season with the Cougars uh, in 24-25. And wrap it up for me today here on the Locked On Zags podcast, folks. Thank you so much for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. We'll be back on Wednesday with one burning question for every single team in the WCC. Check that one out to get you primed and prepped for the upcoming WCC season. Thanks again for listening, folks. And until next time, as always, go Zags.